The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This podcast is brought to you by MetLife 360 Health. MetLife has partnered with Teladoc to provide 360 Health virtual care, which gives your clients access to more than 50,000 local and global medical specialists through the convenience of the 360 Health virtual care app. And best of all, it's at no extra cost as part of their MetLife Protect policy. 360 Health helps to defend against serious illnesses so you can live healthier for longer. MetLife, inspired by you. This week's chat is with Rob McGregor, the co-founder of McGregor Wealth Management and GPS Wealth. Now, they've been long known in the industry for best of breed client engagement. So I wanted to understand, where did this come from? How did you build it? And what actually transpired was learning more about how we built space to build it, how he prototypes, how he's failed, and what knowledge he wanted to impart to young advisors and those of us who are looking to always have best of breed engagement. Enjoy. Hi, Rob. Hey, Jess. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm very excited to speak with you today. No, likewise. Been looking forward to it. Now... We have lots to get through. In fact, I think getting through all the things is going to be our most difficult challenge for today. I know, um, I know. You've built something that I think is desperately needed and really rare in our profession. But before we get stuck into all of that and all of the buzzing questions that are racing through my brain, for the people that do not know you, I'd love for you to go back and give us a bit more of a history of your story Yeah, absolutely. So I'm currently a practicing uh, financial advisor, own practice up in Noosa on the sunny coast, but I actually started out in the accounting domain in Melbourne Mm. uh, a long time ago. I won't say how many, you can probably work it out. But um, I was an accountant in the investment industry, stockbrokers, investment uh, banks, fund managers, that type of thing. 14 years on Collins Street um, till a, a life event sort of and a brain explosion led me to say, I don't want to be an accountant anymore. I don't want to live in Melbourne anymore and packed up the young family and moved to the, the Sunshine Coast and with the goal of being a self-employed financial advisor. So uh, found an opportunity, joined someone, their, their training was, there's your desk. Um, you, you get your own laptop, get your own car, she'll type up your plans um, and I'll give you 40% of whatever you find. That was that was my training. Um, and while I knew a lot about tax, about investing and everything else, I knew nothing about engaging with people, what to say, what to do. Mm. So that started a, a lifelong journey in how do I do this? And the mm. first two years, I was pretty ordinary in terms of financial results, et cetera. Mm. I think I made $17,000 in my first year. Um, and I was thinking, I have to get this right. I do not mm. want to go back to Melbourne. Love Melbourne, but did not want to, didn't want to take a backward step. And, and slowly but surely built, um, yeah, that, that client engagement process to be used with clients. And eventually a few of our colleagues started to say, what are you doing? You guys are doing well. You know, we're getting all sorts of different awards, industry and dealer group and other stuff. And as we showed people, they'd say, can we use this? So we started to, to commercialize it. But none of it was ever built to commercialize, which is which is an interesting thing. So mm. it was all built to use live with clients. Um, and we continued to polish it, continue to polish it to this day. And about uh, 11 years ago, we had um, um, a bunch of people start to say, why don't you guys get your own license? Yeah, your own dealer, put your own dealer group together. So mm. that was GPS Wealth. And... Mm-hmm. 
Uh, we formed that license in February 2012, and we're just gone over 10 years. And uh, yeah, got a great bunch of advisors, great team, uh, doing really, really good things. And um, and I still uh, consult to that business kind of one day a week. But mm-hmm. but these these days, I'm four days a week back in my practice, seeing clients, mentoring other advisors within the practice, and yeah, enjoying. Um, yeah, enjoying that, that, that interaction with clients in particular. You and I were talking before this conversation and I loved the story around how you had to go and present <laughs> to some people. I think it was something to do with a property uh, group and you basically sat down and thought about how you wanted people to engage with their money and engage with finance and that led you from what I believe to be almost like the blueprint for the very successful client engagement product or process. I'm not quite sure what you call it that you've built today. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, we, we were flying in business at that stage at a certain way of dealing with clients, but it still involved a lot of whiteboard and, you know, it, it was still evolving. And, uh, one of my mortgage brokers, um, asked me if I wanted to speak at a, at a seminar or a seminar series. There's going to be three of them by Forrester Kurtz, FKP, who were selling Pridgen Springs here on the coast at that stage. And I thought, oh, I like presenting. I want to get up and present, but I don't want to just help them flog property. I want to show people mm. how property can fit into a good plan. Now, coming from Melbourne, property is a key part of everyone's finances down there. And I'd found mm. in our industry, people didn't, um, want to talk about property. A lot of planners were trained by their dealer groups and instos to, to somehow not talk about property, but it's every client needs to know about it. So I sat down uh, the weekend before the presentation and started to write a case study, um, and it was literally called Pathway to Wealth back then. That's still the name of the process. Um, and it was designed for accumulators, so that is young people in their 30s and 40s, who often aren't neglected by our industry because they didn't have fun. Um, mm. and, but they had cash flow. They potentially had some equity. And it was a, a truth through how they could do some property, do some shares, do some debt recycling to illustrate their super. And as I built the presentation and the case study, I started to set up some spreadsheets, one for super, one for share portfolio, one for property, one for, one for the mortgage. And all of a sudden they were linked and we had really good feedback from the, the seminar. We had people wanting to come and see us. Mm. And then I used those spreadsheets live with them in the meetings that followed um, and kept polishing them. And that became the, the pathway to wealth client engagement software. So we would take people through the goals and then build live with them their solutions, draft, draft solutions, of course. And then say, you know, how does that look? Does that look like a plan that could work for you? And the fact that they could see it in that first meeting got them excited enough to say, yep, let's do it. And that means they could commit to an advice process, pay us a deposit up front. So we weren't selling in the traditional sense where you go away, do a strategy paper, come back. Um, yeah, and some people do two or three meetings before they actually get paid. Mm. And when you're doing that, it kind of, you're chasing the client, you're kind of selling as opposed to flipping it around where the client sees this is their plan. Um, yeah, I'll, how do I get this done? And is that what you refer to as real planning? Or the, what's the concept of real planning for you? Yeah, it was a concept that evolved in a different sort of time frame. We did we specialised in working with accountants, and I found that accountants didn't really know what we as financial planners did. Mm. Uh, most of them thought we were the investment people or mm. the insurance people. Mm. So it was very much product focused. Um, and they would set up someone super fund and say, all right, uh, are you going to manage this yourself or do you want some help with the investments? And so they'd send people off and there was no real plan. Um, so we evolved a couple of client engagement pieces around that. One was a concept called the game of money, which mm. I'm going to talk through shortly. But the other was, was real planning. And real planning, if you think about any sort of planning, whether it's business planning, a holiday plan, you, you, you start off with a crystal clear picture of exactly where you are now. So if it's a holiday plan, it's all right, I'm sitting here in Noosa as we speak. I want to go to Barcelona. 
So, mm -hmm. and, and you start to map out a plan. And for financial planning, that is, all right, here's what I've got in assets, liabilities, income, here's my tax position, here's my structures, here's my estate planning or not, here's my insurances or not. So an absolute crystal clear picture of a starting point and then some goals. So before we talk about any tactics, any strategies, we've got the goals and we've, we've developed um, prompts to have goal conversations with clients about all sorts of things. So once we've got the goals, we can then turn those goals into financial goals, evaluate the strategy. So the five elements of what I'd call real planning is a crystal clear picture of the starting point, meaningful goals that are based on people's lives. So questions that, that ask them and get deep about what's important to them and what that means financially. So then we've got the bookends and then step three is to evaluate their current strategies and do some projections to see if they're on track and then to introduce some alternative strategies and show them live within that first meeting how they can get to those goals. And then we've got all that comes together in a plan, which is step four. And step five is to execute, to have the mindset to get things done and to review, rinse, repeat, uh, avoid the big mistakes, make smart decisions. So that five steps of real planning. And it's funny, then a, when you think about it, then applies to business planning, same thing. What's mm. my starting point in my business? What's my ideal? What are the strategies using at the moment? What's working? What's not working? All right, let's revise, create a plan, then let's execute. Same for a holiday plan, same for any plan. So that's why I use you know, inverted commas, real planning. And it's not to disrespect you know, anyone else and what they do, but I think for a lot of our industry, they've come through an institutional background where mm. Insta has taught them what to do. Uh, they, they gave them the train tracks from the institutional point of view. So here were the products you could talk about. Here was the, here was the things you can't talk about. And there's a lot of great advisors in our industry that have worked out their own version of real planning. But I dare say there's still a lot of people that focus 90% on the strategies and the tactics without necessarily the goals and the starting point. We, I mean, most people come to us just with, kind of tactical questions. People come and say, oh, I'm thinking of starting a self-managed super fund. Is that a good idea? Or mm. I'm thinking of buying some BHP shares. Is that a good idea? And they're tactics. You know, they're, they're, and so we prefer to reframe in those situations and say, look, we believe the best financial decisions are best made as part of a real plan. Have you got a plan in place? And most people go, no. And then we'll introduce the concept of what it is and take it from there. And for the people that get that, it's liberating because they get away from thinking they're going to buy a property or some BHP shares or get a self-managed super fund because that's starting with the tactics. And we used to use a concept, you know, if I'm going on holidays, you know, I'm not going to start by saying, when someone says, where are you going? If I answered, oh, I want to go Qantas, yeah, that's, I've jumped straight to a tactic before I've worked out you know, yeah. what my strategy is and even more importantly, what my destination is. Mm. Um, so that's kind of in a, in a hopefully not too long-winded way uh, the, the key sort of concepts. No, I think it's um, I think it's not long-winded. I think it's an it's an interesting process that you built almost like a, a replicable program that could be, from what I understand, it picked up and and you really heavily have made sure that tech supports advisor conversations and enables light bulb moments for the people that are coming and working with the advisors. So no doubt that's iterated a lot from the spreadsheet version that was however many years ago. What does tech look like in this process now? So the text varied and the, the original spreadsheet, which was about six tabs, grew to about 20 tabs over time. So it stayed spreadsheet based right through the start of the dealer group. Uh, and we would train people in it. And there was, before we started GPS Wealth, we had a coaching program for advisors, Pathway to Wealth, hmm. where we had about 20 advisors that were using the program and, and still do to this day quite successfully. We evolved. We've had three attempts as a dealer group to develop that tech into online stuff. Uh, the first, we burnt a lot of time and money. didn't work. But it was because we tried to link the front end to the back end. We had this uh, dream that we could finish a meeting um, and almost press a few buttons and produce compliant uh, advice documents. Mm. Uh, that one failed, so we went back and we've developed uh, the online version of Pathway to Wealth that doesn't doesn't attempt to do that. That'll still be another time for another day, but the, 
as as you're aware, the compliance for our industry is so complicated Mm -hmm. that we didn't want to ruin good client engagement by sticking the compliance bit too far uh, in in advance. Right. So we've got and that that the yeah the tech produces supporting documents for the statements of advice etc. But there's all sort of the basic tech is simple. and I could sit next to someone on a plane and with a bit of paper could do most of the engagement and then it's just the tech to do the calculation. So as well as, as, well as the tech, um, someone taught me and I was saying not long ago that um, yeah, a, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, and we see this in all sorts of industries. You know, you look online now, we can all diagnose ourselves online and we all become hypochondriacs. Mm-hmm. So the tech isn't the only thing. The actual, the, the process itself, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a believer that the, the number one skill of a great advisor is, is brilliant question and listening skills. So knowing how to ask the right questions, knowing how to listen, knowing how to pivot into deeper questions or into, to help understand people and what's really important to them. So that goes hand in hand with the tech. The tech's the tech's an enabler. It's not the main event. So very important because it allows the advisor to show people um, what they can achieve. Um, but it's not it's it's not the main thing. Um, and I hope I'm explaining this in a way that makes sense. So yeah, it's it's critical of the people skills plus enabled by the tech. So the tech's pretty basic. You know, I'm sitting here in my in my typical meeting room where I'd meet with a client. Mm. There's a big screen on the wall. Mm. Clients would sit across me. We'd both be looking at the screen and we'd initially both be looking at each other. We'd be engaging in our pre-planning chat, getting to know them. Uh, and then when, once, once we get down into that, building the picture of their world and then building the goals, we're building that on the screen. So it's live with them. And as we start to then do the strategies and the projections that go with that. Um, yeah, they 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 become engaged, and it's like a story. Because what happens to most people is say, yeah, we'll ask some questions about you know their goals, whether that's retirement goals, semi-retirement goals, financial independent goals. Um, and let's say we put up a target of someone retiring with a hundred thousand dollars a year, mm-hmm. and that'll pop up a lump sum. Let's call it one point eight million that they're going to need to achieve that, and we mm-hmm. can go through questions about all of that stuff. But then we'll build the strategies. And when we're starting, they'll put up their existing super and it might be a hundred thousand. Yeah, they'll put up their existing mortgage and it looks such a long way away in terms of ability to achieve that. But as we go through and build each strategy, it gets closer and closer and we watch them lean forward like a good movie and they're they're starting to, to get involved. It's their future, it's their plan. And eventually, for most people, we can solve that plan. We might have to, you know, move the years. We might have to tweak the strategies. We might have to make some assumptions about pay rises and this and that. But all of a sudden, we, we get to a pitch and we go, is that starting to look like a plan that could work for you guys? And they'll, they'll, they'll either be excited or they'll have questions. Mm. They'll say, tell me more about how this debt recycling strategy works or tell me more about, you know, how, how this property strategy works. And for lots of clients, they don't have property, but it's just one of the toolkit uh, in there, um, including just regular dollar cost averaging. The strategies, um, I've done lots of mastermind sessions with advisors that we're training. And when you come up with wealth creation strategies, you struggle after about six of the leading ones. Yeah, there really is only so many ways to build wealth once you take out building businesses or, or active sort of trading. And speculating, yeah, and that's dollar cost averaging, gearing, yeah, putting money into super, buying investment property, and you start to run out pretty quickly. There's a lot of ways to do all those things. There's a lot of nuances around where you do that, how you do it, um, and that's where the conversations come in. So where my mission is at the moment is is enabling uh, tech at the back end mm. that then does produce compliance documents but also that keeps the clients engaged uh, along the way. We're still developing a lot of that. I've always been a front-end person, so the client engagement, the client meetings, um, the back-end is necessary, but it's not my passion. And I have some amazing people on my team that produce that stuff, but mm. uh, it's not something I would ever yeah, want to do myself. Mm-hmm. And I'm waiting like many of us for the for, for the tech gurus to help us solve some of the automation yeah when we can sit back and say hey siri you've seen the strategy notes 
do me a plan, please. And Siri pops it out. But um, I haven't seen anything yet that actually does that. So because we've made it so complicated. You know, I was just thinking but when you were saying this, I was like, we're planning to put people on other planets. I know. At the moment. And we can't. So, like, isn't it absolute? It does. It, the it mind, does my head in. Yes. yes. And it sounds like you've been through a journey. Yeah, we've, we've burnt money and we're still, we, you know, it's not something we'll ever give up on. Yeah. Um, and we have good processes, don't get me wrong, that, that get stuff done. Mm. But that, you know, we, to sit there with a the client, you know, we do lots of meetings on Zoom. We record meetings these days. We've got this engagement tool that, that does the draft strategies uh, with machine learning and all this other stuff, yeah, you know, there's got to be a point somewhere in the next decade where you're going, all right, hey, Siri, power planner, produce me first draft of the document. Yeah. And, yeah, they, as you say, they put a man on the moon. Uh, they're putting people into space. It can't be that hard. But <laughs> yeah, you, you know what it's like for your power planners and stuff. It's a very piecemeal manual process. This still takes way more time, particularly for full plans, not just mm. product plans, you know, not just risk super type stuff, but for genuinely, I don't love the word holistic because I think it got hijacked by product providers, but for what, and that's why I use the term real planning, mm. but for, for real plans, they're complicated. Yeah, you know, there's lots of factors involved. And at the moment, I've got a, a wonderful team and we use, we use tech in that process, of course, um, but none of it is um, seamless and integrated yet. No, my power planner, bless her, she we allowed her to go and leave, Rob. I know. Oh, I don't wow. know what we were thinking. <laughs> and in my haste to get something out, I was like, no, it's fine. I'll write this plan. Oh, dear advisors, if you want to do something <laughs> fun for your mental health, go and write a plan. If you haven't written a plan in a while, honestly, by the end of the day, I was like, oh, I couldn't, there's no, there's no way uh, I could do this job. You and, you and me both. And, yeah, <gasps> you and me both. The 25 years ago, I could write my own plans. Um, I've, I've given up a long, long time ago. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I view it as the advisor's job to have the relationship with the client. Totally. To, to own the strategy. But to me, that's the strategy and the bullet points. Some advisors love modeling. I'm happy to give that to my team to model what we've already set up in the client engagement tools. Mm. And, and that then gives them their ammunition, but also gives them training in yeah, the modeling around the strategies and get to compare. Mm. But I'm very happy for them to develop that. We're, we're in the process of uh, having to replace our power plan at the moment. And it's uh, yeah, very, very nerve wracking trying to find someone who'll be able to slot in. And they're much in demand at the moment as well. They really are. And I think if we want to get serious about giving affordable advice to more people, then that is an enormous challenge because it is so bloody manual. Anyway, and for me, whinging about having to write one plan. um, (laughs) You made an interesting point before about the fool. I sort of giggled because I think perhaps (laughs) I am one. But I I like the idea that – and, you know, I – I think about 10 years ago, people were in a panic that tools like the tools that you were developing were going to come up and gobble all of the opportunities for advisors and take over. And of course, that that's never eventuated. In fact, it's supported the opposite conversation, which is actually we value humans and we value relationships and we value interconnectedness of understanding and coaching. Um, But the tool supports those conversations. One thing that I was actually discussing with um, uh, our business mentor earlier this week was just around how do we train, how do we help advisors learn the questions and the EQ things that they've never learnt before in those big instos? How does GPS solve for that? So we do um, lots of mentoring, lots of training uh, at the base level when people Mm. come into the group. There's a, there's a library of training. They go through an induction process, but we have so much. Sometimes it's like drinking from a fire hose. So there's, there's videos that they can watch um, this, the process is being done. 
And um, I recognise completely all advisors have their own style and personality that they like to apply to a process. So we don't pretend sure. to say this is the only way to do it. Mm. Um, but we provide the, the train tracks and the, the frameworks and the infrastructure for them to use that if it's uh, valuable. And we, we have a phrase we call adopt or adapt. So if you haven't got something that's working in a place, adopt this. But if you've got something that you kind of like, then then adapt around it. But So at the base level is induction. There's regular training. When we started the group, um, we deliberately called our, our training days um, success days, not PD days and not because I found in past groups I'd been a part of, the PD days were product flog days where they grabbed six providers, lovely people from the institutional sponsors or partners, and they did a session that was often about the product um, not about the, the stuff that mattered to most. So I tended not to go to a lot of those because mm. I found them meaningless. And this is before you could be working around the phone. And I know when I'm at any training session, I'll look around the room and judge the content by how many people have got their phones under the desk. <laughs> um, and truly good content, people have put their phones down and they're listening. So we like to think we do that. So there's our success days are focused on their success. So that means practice development, Conversations with clients. I run four advanced client engagement webinars per year for our group, um, as well as two ideal practice, ideal life webinars. So it's a constant quest. Um, and and you know, we're all learning. You know, 25 years in, I still learn. I love last week I was down for our GPS Young Guns, which are our up and coming, uh, awesome advisors. Uh, we had about 30. Uh, in Sydney, and I've got the notepad out. I'm writing just as many notes because they're they're more tech engaged, they're more savvy, uh, and and yeah. So I find that that stuff still massively beneficial. But the the EQ stuff, the empathy stuff, uh, we try and teach that. We've got yeah a broad broad scripts for for first meetings, but we we're teaching people. That it's not really a script; it's a process. And here's some some basic questions. So once you get to ask people about their goals, here's some questions you can ask. Yeah, and they're, they're really simple, but the art form and the advanced training that we do is about how to go deeper on something. So and I'll, I'll give you an example. If I sit there and say to someone, so if you were retired right now, how much would you need coming in each year to pay for a nice life? So there's, there's some really structure around that, that sentence. One is if you're retired now. So it's not what will you need in 15 years, what will you need in 20 years, what will you need in five years. It's, and, and often people go, you mean when the kids are grown up? And say, yeah, assume your kids are grown up if you've got kids. When the mortgage is paid off? Yeah, assume that. But we're just trying to get them to think. And they'll often go, that's a good question. We haven't thought about that. Mm. And you go, wow, that's the first element of your future is how much you're going to need. Uh, and most people have never thought about it. And, say, and they'll say, have a, have a go. And they'll pick a number and it might be, some people are notoriously low and some people are notoriously high. Um, but we've already got, because we've got their current position up on the screen, I've got their income in, that's calculated the tax. So I can see, we've talked about the mortgage, so I can do a quick check. So if they say, yeah, 100,000 is what we're gonna uh, need. And that's just question one of about four, but I'll, I'll pause on that one. And I'll do a quick fact check. So rather than send out a budget, I find 90% of the population, if you send out a budget, they will just procrastinate and not come and see you. It's like torture for them to have to fill in a budget. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't ask for them, but we'll do some sanity checking around their numbers. So that if they say they're spending 100000 right now, and we, we can look and see what they're taking home, we can look at their mortgage, we can look at the kids' school fees and any other things. We'll say, well, looks like... And, and let's say that shows up a notional surplus of $24,000. We can then say, okay, looks like you're saving about two grand a month. Does that feel right? And where is it? Mm, mm. Sometimes they look at each other and go, yeah, we're definitely not doing that. And then we might have a conversation that, well, maybe you're actually spending 120 grand a year. And they go, oh, no, actually, we spent the last two years renovating the house. So you have a real conversation that's not about, here's your budget. Because I would challenge anyone. Most people are notoriously bad at doing a budget. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's just a painful exercise. So, yeah, the conversations around that, there's one question that triggers that, but there's a whole series of places to go from that for a skillful advisor to eventually go, okay, looks like 100 grand's a good target. Yeah, that's going to continue your, your, your standard of living. 
there's then further questions that would ask, you know, things like, okay, so that covers, you know, a good life, but would that cover all the nice stuff, good holidays, other things you might want to do when you're financially free? And they'll either go, yeah, it covers it, or no, we probably, we like our travel, we probably need to allow another twenty or 30000 for travel. And we're keying these numbers in, then we ask a couple of legacy questions and questions around whether they're going to need toys or house renovations or funding for kids or helping parents and all these things. So we end up building a number and a goal and then we start to build. Um, so yeah, the, the training then is around what you say in key moments. Yeah, when, when someone says, wow, that looks like a lot or, um, or they start to dive into any questions on um, the tactics too early, you know, how you sort of deal with that or if they occasionally get some people that say, I'm going to need 300000 to retire. And they're earning 100000 they're spending 40000 And you go, what? Yeah, why are you going to need 300000 to retire? So you've got to, have, you've got to know when to have a conversation and not just take it face value. Um, and all these conversations on the goals are only after we've asked questions to establish who and what's important to them in their life. Mm. So, yeah. And we want, because it's only when you get deep and, and yeah, I won't go through all the questions, but one of the questions at the end, when we've just about got all the goals, we say, is there any other goals that are going to require money for you guys? And that might be something like we've always wanted to have a sabbatical. We want to take a year and go and live in Europe. Or we actually want to have a holiday house. Or, uh, But that's when the real stuff comes out. So it might be right at the end of the meeting where we've done this thing and, it's, and, and they're getting there easy. And as we're talking about, you know, a good question would be, and if I asked you this, Jess, and, and feel free to either role play or or deliver, but if if you were sitting doing your plan mm-hmm. and it showed that you were getting to financial independence in 10 years, mm-hmm. a simple question I would ask is, would you actually retire? No. And that's what most people say. So, but but you've got it because you don't just want to make this a retirement plan, but the, the follow-up question is, what would you do differently? Yeah. Me? And that gets people thinking, yeah, for you, what would you do differently? Totally, totally wouldn't be able to retire. My brain, I mean, you. Uh, You you you, and me both. Yeah, Yeah. my brain would go to mush. Um, I've always thought about going back to uni later, later, later and studying something that probably has no commercial value but quite interesting. So, like ancient history with like some awesome opportunities to go and travel and see those places. I'd love the opportunity to do more community work. I'm I'm quite a passionate feminist, so helping women around the world and all of that sort of stuff. So I don't think, you know, I work with a a lot of younger people as well. I don't think many people actually aspire to the golf on Wednesdays rhetoric anymore. And for someone like you or, or, or me that's used their brains all through their career, retiring the brain is just a, a scary concept. And yeah. I, I watch a lot of people when they get to enough money and they just don't retire. And you keep saying, well, what's, and the thing is they like their work or they like most of it. So at that point, all of a sudden we're going to have some conversation around lifestyle design. Mm. Okay, what would an ideal life look like? And even bring some of that right back to the present. So why wait for that? Why not have, and we've talked about this before, things like sabbaticals or three-month mini vacations or whatever it is, and yeah. then you're getting into into really cool. And some people have the traditional, yep, I'm going to work for 20 years and then I'm going to stop work and I'll play golf on Wednesdays and go fishing on Fridays and whatever, but most people don't. And mm. it's, it's, it's having the, the questions and the EQ to dive deep on that so that that plan you're building is a genuine, real plan for them that they're excited about. It's not your plan is to achieve, you know, to have a high growth investment and to, yeah, the goals that, and I won't name any names, but big institutions taught advisors to put these goals in, which were either product goals mm. or butt covering goals. Mm. And, yeah. And, and they've got nothing to do with people's lives. Uh, and when people read those statements of advice, they go, oh, it doesn't feel like my plan. But mm. if someone reads, and I hate the term SOA and statement of advice because, yeah, I, I still like to say, here's your financial plan. Mm. Now, one day maybe we have financial plans that are supported by cascading pieces of advice on particular product stuff. I think that's part of the solution, but yeah, we'll get there eventually. Mm. But you want something that's exciting. Yeah. 
if people are excited about their future, then they're willing to commit to certain things to get there. Yeah, totally. And sometimes we see people that they can retire. Yeah, you know, I had someone um, yesterday and I go, you've kind of won the war. You can stop work now. What, what stops you? And they said, oh, I'm not ready. You know, and so mm. then we got into a good conversation about what are the things that you're doing now that you, you don't really enjoy, you don't get satisfaction out of, what would you stop doing, start doing? All, all the questions we've all heard people ask when you come into this um, idea of life planning. So, yeah, we have this concept when we're coaching advisors of helping them um, define their, their, their goals around ideal practice, ideal life, giving great advice. So what, what for them is an ideal practice? And for all of us, it's different at different stages. You know, for me, when my kids were young, it was that I could attend every sporting event that they ever had. So I had the flexibility to duck out of the office and go and watch the football or the swimming or the netball or whatever it was. Um, and it was to have so many holidays a year. And the question I often ask advisors, how do you know you still own your life? You know, what's the key activity that you'd love to do that you set aside time for first and you don't let the business interrupt no matter what? How many of them have working plans for that to make sure? Our advisors? Correct. Um, nearly all of them. Um, and often, often those plans, and they're probably like a bit, well, I'll, I'll ask you this question, but for a lot of it, our advisors are, are younger than the industry average okay. and we, we have a, a, a better gender balance than the industry average. Okay. So because of that nature, some of them are in the midst of young, young families, not all of them. So for them, it's just having, you know, someone wise once said to me, when you've got a young family, work-life balance is family and work. And mm. almost nothing else except trying to keep a little bit fit. You're not going to be you're not going to be able to fit in everything else if you want to achieve that. So yeah, for all of them, we talk about what that good life looks like. But it's amazing how many of them are ambitious and right at this stage of their life, they actually want to work really hard. It's actually just they're hungry. They want to they want to achieve some goals. So they don't want to play golf on Wednesday or something. Mm. I mean, when I first had this coaching done to me back in 2004. The thing was to just do what I liked on Wednesdays. So I would work from home on Wednesdays. I would, and that was a day that I coached kids in the afternoon um, in, in surf life saving sort of stuff, surf sports. So I'd work from home, I'd go up to lunch with my wife, but I'd fit in stuff in between that was high value. So that was the creative side. And that was how I knew I owned my life. The rest of the week was manic um, and trying to keep up with the fast growing practice. But Wednesdays was my day where I could schedule that how I liked. I'd work from home. Occasionally I'd compromise and do a phone meeting or some phone calls. But most of the time that's where I did the creative side of the business, thought about what the future looked like for me, thought about how to help people better and built and polished a lot of the tools, etc. Everything, I was talking about to someone in our group the other day, but every, every tool, every process I've ever built for myself and then for other advisors has been built out of the office. Not one thing was built in the office where it had in the diary three to four, build a client engagement tool. They all came from random events like where we started um, completely. Not one thing was ever built in the office. Isn't that just such an interesting point? Because sometimes we're forcing, we're trying to force innovation when our brain is not in its optimal state to build innovation. And then we berate ourselves for not building the thing in the environment that's probably not conducive for us to do that. And it's a good reminder that, you know, sometimes those, those moments to step away and give yourself the space is exactly what you need. Yeah, no white, white space in the diary and no pressure to have any output. And mm -hmm. you know, I walk on the beach most mornings and sometimes the, the most random solutions come up when you're not thinking about it, you know, walking the dog or whatever, looking at the surf and all of a sudden this stuff pops into your mind. And I'm mm. a great believer that if you sort of, if you know you've got a challenge or you know you want to improve in some area, kind of plant the seed in your brain. And, you know, in the weirdest, you know, for some people it's in the shower, for some it's, you know, while they're watching their kids netball at the weekend, all of a sudden this idea pops in their head. And, you know, I've had some of those over the years where all of a sudden you're just, you're just trying to find a notepad and just write mm. endlessly and scribble and draw and then, and then test. Um, 
Yeah. And, and yeah, I just believe if you don't make space for that or if you try and schedule it or worse, um, create a committee to do it, you know, and, and all sit around a table and design it, you get, yeah, you get, you get stuff, which we've had over the years that in, with the best of intention mm. comes down from big institutions and says to us advisors, here's how you should run a first meeting. Um, here's a tool you should use and not one person in that design group has ever sat in front of a client. Mm. So common. Um, I'm giggling because um, on my dining table, I have like a raft of different post-it notes because what I find is I like come back Absolutely. from walking the dog or something and I'm like, I have to get it out of my brain. And even if it sits on the post-it note for a little while, as long as I'm clear in what the hell I was thinking, um, I then sort of I have a couple of different books depending on whether it's about sort of, you know, different parts yep. of the business and then I can go back and iterate it. But um, And do you find, Jess, that the tangible thing of writing is much better than trying to type when you're creative? So actually physically writing, whether it's a pen or an electric pen or whatever, is that how your creative brain works? My brain is quite wild and creative and not very structured and organized as those of you who listen regularly might have picked up on. Um, You know, listening to you, I just had a light bulb moment going, I never am very innovative in front of a screen, actually. And I'm always in front of a screen. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think the screen's a useful part. Uh, there's, I don't know if you've ever come across an influencer out of Canada called Dean Jackson. Mm -mm. He's, he's brilliant in the uh, online marketing space. He specialized in coaching real estate agents. Uh, but he's, he's he sets himself up for these sessions where he has – a specific, he calls it his evil hatchery room, uh, and he goes in this room. It's got whiteboards, um, and it's just a, you know, a a comic thing. But he's got his post-it notes, scribbles, no devices whatsoever, mm. uh, no connections to internet, and and that's where he does his creative stuff. Um, and 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 yeah, you leave yourself clues. I I I love my iPad. I don't have it connected to the internet. I can connect to the internet. But I, I, I like a good mind map, and I also have my iPen where I'll scribble. Mm. I would have thousands of pages on my iPad of ideas, and then I'll sort of get, come back to some of them. And then every now and then, one of them I'll just go bang, all right. And it might be response to a client was in yesterday, and we're trying to work something out, and all of a sudden, it's, it, it adds another dimension to what might be the solution. And yeah, you know, the fun of what we what we do in GPS, we can feed that back to the network and keep evolving. And some of that comes from them as well. Yeah, you know, I have a, a belief within our network that all the best ideas should come from practice world. Mm. We need people to help us who've got compliance skills, etc. But yeah, if I'm at the moment, I'm on the search for a lot of good back end tech, yeah, and to automate office and stuff. And I just want to see a practice that's got it's working and adopt it. I don't want to reinvent the world. I don't want to be um, an experiment for someone. Mm. Uh, show me something that's working. I'll plug it in. Now, mm. for some things, I like to create myself. Mm. But that's mainly the front end. But on the back end, I just want a solution proven that I can plug in that hopefully has been street tested by, by advisors and practices similar to, to mine. You know, it's amazing to think, Rob, that you've built – what is arguably the most successful engagement tools in the profession? I mean, GPS has always been known for what you've built. And we could talk all day about sort of what that looks like and the iterations, et cetera. But actually, the big epiphany for me is none of this would have happened if you hadn't been able to give yourself space and time to do it. And so for everyone that's busy with all of the compliance, regulatory, member, client, stuff i think it would be so interesting to see how much more innovation can come out of our beautiful community if we all were able to give ourselves more space to just think with these problems it's just essential for your your mental health and your work-life balance as well um and yeah this i've there's been times in my career where i've worked ridiculous hours so part of that journey and for most people um, either when they're starting their business or at a certain stage. And there was a time in the 2003 to 2008 where I was probably working 60 to 80 hour weeks and I'd get up at 3.30 to 4 a.m. I'd do some work and then I'd go surfing at 6.30 and then I'd, yeah. And 
was just grinding. And part of it was thrilling because we were building at a crazy pace, but part of it was unsustainable. But the things I kept in, even in that, was this Wednesdays at home and, and yeah, at least most of the weekend. Well, Wednesdays at home, all my kids' sporting events and, and yeah, make sure there's time for the family and plenty of holidays. So, because that's not sustainable and um, mm. I make no attempt to, to work that sort of level these days. Although, yeah, we can be on holidays and, and uh, my wife would tell you all of a sudden I would go, oops, and my iPad will come out and I'll write <laughs> one, of the, one of the client engagement pieces we have. We're at Ellie Beach and I woke up at 3.30 in the morning with all of a sudden this idea and I snuck out to the balcony watching the sun slowly come up for four hours scribbled what would become this key piece in our, in our client engagement tour. Um, and it was overlooking the water in Early Beach at the dark and then watching the sun come up, four hours of scribbling, drawing, getting down all the concepts, then then going to the screen. So then to what we were talking about before, Jess, then you go to the screen to start to turn it into something usable but not before the blueprint is kind of, yeah. kind of there. And then I I love testing that stuff with clients straight away. So I, you know, the next person that walks in for a meeting, they're going to get that that tested and to, and that that helps refine it um, and that's partly why I still love seeing clients because I get to to c- continually evolve this stuff in the real world of sitting across the, the the desk from a client. So you just ju- I love this. So you just build a prototype or a s- version of a prototype, a very very prototypey prototype, and then you just you use it and then iterate rather than trying to tinker enormously and then show it to someone most of the time yeah Mm -hmm. and and, yeah for the ones that have worked by the way the ones that are embedded in our process there's dozens that didn't work yeah or that i tried with clients and and after three months ago you know what it's not adding any value i'm going to ditch that um so there's 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 a trail of stuff that hasn't worked but i've always been game enough to try it um yeah and sometimes it can be a question you know i had a my original um client engagement process and let me call it a sales process because I came out from an accounting background I'd had no sales training Mm. and I think we all need sales training Mm. it gets a bad name Mm. because the people that have the best training are often manipulators and and but yeah I say if you want to help real people you have to be better than the manipulators and the and the spruikers and all the rest of it so you've got to and they're really people skills and soft skills applied well and ethically the, the, so the, the process, so yeah, so we'll, we'll test those processes. And, and a good example was, yeah, I was always as part of my process, very big on building rapport. So the first five to ten minutes of a meeting, lots of questions: where you're from, how long you've been there, what do you, yeah, and trying trying to find connections with people. And four years ago, I I, I did some sales consulting with a top sales trainer, um, and I still love getting coached and doing courses myself. Uh, because the world continues to evolve rapidly. Mm. Um, and this guy said, no, nah, don't do that. He said, that is so old school. People know that the salesperson is in their rapport mode when they're doing it these days. And so they're just waiting for the meeting to begin because the old school way said, build rapport and at a certain point say, okay, and then you get down to your spill. And that's when that person in their head is going, all right, they're now going to try and sell me something. Mm. So instead of that, he said, look, your rapport will be built during the meeting by the good questions you ask. So at the start of the meeting, you're trying to connect them back to why they reached out. So one of the first questions, there's a, there's a tiny bit of connecting them back. So you say something like, so I see you booked a meeting online at, yeah, at midnight last Thursday with yeah when, when you booked the meeting burning the midnight oil and they'll laugh and immediately go back to that point and at that point you can say what prompted you to reach out right now Mm. so that question all of a sudden they're reaching out to us we're not trying to sell them anything yeah so they get back to their problem so that little framing and and it's 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 only been a minor change in my overall process but one the meeting times dropped (laughs) because we're not spending this and if you get a talkative person up front you can spend 25 minutes chatting before you get down to the planning uh, which can be nice but we we try and advise in personality profiling as well so you should be able to tell which people like that which people don't etc mm. as well um, but yeah the, the the prototypes are always changing and not so much so 
Sometimes the tech will change, but the conversations around the tech, the, sorry, sometimes the tech will stay the same, but the conversations will get better. Mm. So we'll, we'll, we'll come up with better questions to ask at certain times. Um, yeah, one of my favorite questions when we get this plan up on the screen for people and they go, wow, this looks really good, is just to say, so what stopped you from having this all in place right now? And that takes them back to why they came in once again. Well, we, I'm too busy. You know, I don't actually know how to do this. Mm. So all of a sudden, yeah. And then you can ask a simple question. Would you like some help with putting all this together? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is very basic. And yeah, and, and we're not trying to, we're not trying to close. We're not trying to yeah, sell people. We're just trying to help them get to their goals, which we've really well thought out. Amazing. And I am so, um, I wish. I bloody wish we had this conversation five years ago because (laughs) I was trying to build things in a period. That's what everyone says. (laughs) (laughs) Look, I've got a lot of years ahead of me, I hope, uh, in this wonderful world. Um, But I am so guilty, Rob. We in our little business have been so guilty of building, building things in a Petri dish, trying to perfect things because our profession demands perfection in a lot of areas. And so that can bleed through. And so you waste so much bloody time trying to build something and get it to what you think is perfect. And then you And there's bits there's bits of our businesses that we have to, you know, around our compliance. Yeah. I've got I've got an audit next week, so we want to pass with flying colours and we've got a broken Mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's always a little stressful time for the team. Mm. Uh, And that stuff's gotta be perfect or it's gotta be very good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, yeah, we're in we're in a people business, so a lot of the when I talk about client engagement, it's it's about the, the soft skills of questioning and listening and diving deeper and helping people to motivate themselves. Um, someone, one of my coaches, once said yeah, the difference between motivation and manipulation, yeah, is 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 what it's used for. So if someone has a genuine goal that they desperately want to achieve, but they're having trouble because they're too busy, they don't know how to do certain things, and you use good people skills and listening skills and questioning skills to help them get what they want, that's motivation. It's not manipulation. Mm. But someone can use those same skills to get people to do what they don't want that's not good for them, Mm. and that's manipulation. Mm. But if we're doing – if we – do if we think we do good things for people, then we should be our best when it comes to personal skills of being able to talk to people and help them get what they need. And if that means saying, I don't think we're right for you, if that means saying, I'm not sure I'm the right person to help you right now, mm. so be it. Mm. And that, that's a common conversation that we would have if, if someone's not a good fit right now. Like in our business, I don't do any transactional work. I have other people. If someone says, oh, I want some income protection insurance or I need that or I want to consolidate all my supers. We just don't do it. Yeah. Now, that's not to say others shouldn't, but that's just you know, 25 years in a business, that's where it evolved to. Mm. I've got some wonderful people that I can refer that to. Mm. And sometimes I'll point them back to their one of their existing supers and say, why don't you talk to your industry super fund about consolidating and then you know, come and see us. We'll show them some of the strategy stuff and when you're ready to start you know, building out some strategy and a plan, that's 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 going to be the time to see us. Um, yeah. Um, and what I've loved hearing from today's conversation is you've tinkered, you've developed, you've prototyped, you've failed, you've made mistakes, you've iterated <laughs> and you've built and you've moved on and, and that client engagement has been at the core of everything that you've developed to make sure that people are understanding what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how it connects to their goals. Absolutely. And to me, that's the most important bit. Mm. And when I started this journey 25 years ago, it was the bit I did not know how to do. I knew about tax. I was an accountant. I'd been in the investment industry for 14 years. I knew how to analyze shares. I knew how to do all this stuff. But it was all useless without the skills of being able to have decent conversations with clients and show them what we do. Another, I forget who this came from, but... Um, there's kind of someone someone told me once there's three ways for people to know how good you are. One is you can tell them, and that's not so good. That's yep. the Fig Jam Club. Yeah. I mean, most people will know what that means. Yep. I mean, there are people that are members of the Fig Jam Club. Yeah. The other way is someone else can tell them. That's pretty good. Mm. If your clients or an accountant tells them. But I believe the best way is when you show them. When they come into your office and you show them what you do, there's they absolutely know what financial planning is. They don't have to read 
a document that says this is what we do because you've shown them what you do in that first meeting. Mm. Rob, I, I, we have the problem that I thought we were going to have. I, I, just, I have all of the questions, but I have loved having a chat. Can we just do a couple of round out pieces and then absolutely unfortunately i need to let you go but you know we could chat all day if people want to learn more about you and the great work that you do and gps how and where should people find you my dear gps website um predominantly mm. um I, I have a lot of advisors that stalk us on our own website mcgregor wealth management just to see how we present on some of those things we're quite active in the digital marketing space and stuff like that cool um and I don't mind that. So generally through through GPS and the wonderful team there. Okay. So, uh, yeah, reach out to any any of the people there. Um, yeah, or hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm notoriously bad checker on that, but occasionally uh, I do. And we're a very small industry. So, mm. yeah, there's, I've learned over years, you're only two degrees separation from everyone in this industry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I dare say there's someone that, I would know that knows someone. And uh, my main focus these days is my practice and mentoring within our group. Mm -hmm. So I used to be involved in onboarding advisors, but I've got a wonderful team that, that does that. Oh, we have a wonderful team at GPS mm. that does that. So if anyone's looking uh, at some of that, and yeah, reach out to them um, and you'll get me through that. that. Amazing. Are you ready for some rapid fire questions? Far away. You look nervous. Don't be nervous. <laughs> I, you've sort of talked about this a little bit, but let's just get it definitively. What is one thing that you do that looks after your mental health? I'm a surfer and I live across the road from the beach. So I walk on the beach every day and then I work out whether I'm just walking, whether I'm swimming, surfing, paddling or what I'm doing. And that's that's a key part of my mental health where mm. I'm not thinking about work mm. and trying to keep fit as well but have that white space time where yeah i don't think about work in the surf occasionally random ideas will pop up but yeah i'm not thinking about it at that point mm -hmm. uh, what's a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self <laughs> it's funny we're just about to do a series for we've got 16 people in our groups that are on their professional year mm. and we're just designing a webinar and yesterday we came with the name 10 messages i would send to myself when i was starting out in the industry um learn the soft skills quicker okay so the message would be yeah forget about mastering the latest tax strategies or etc you'll know people who can do those mm. and have those on the slow burn mm. but master conversational skills master listening and develop your genuine empathy towards clients so you can't fake these things mm. i mean in our industry i mean people people do but most people are kind of they, they can sense it so my message to myself would be learn the soft skills quicker okay uh, what's one big thing on your bucket list that you haven't ticked off yet? Uh, uh, oh, there's, there's so many, and they, they were they were frozen by COVID when when we got locked down. <laughs> I was just about to jump on a plane with my son and go surfing in the Mentawis in Sumatra. Uh, oh. So we're booked to do that in March. So that'll be ticked off. Uh, I think my wife and I are going to Europe in in October. I bungee jumped last year and I'm scared of heights because one of our kids said if I did it, he'd do it. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm trying to, I, I can't think of one. Um, well, there's some big ones. Yeah, well, they're, they're mostly done. But um, yeah, surfing next year, back surfing with my son in, in the remote islands of, of Sumatra will, will be the one for now. Mm. Actually getting there and being fit enough to get there. Mm. Um, yeah. Not fit enough to get there, fit enough to handle the, the, the waves, which are pretty good there. Yeah, I'd be sipping a pina colada at the shoreline under some sort of cabana <laughs> thing. <laughs> yes. uh, last question for you. Do you have a book that I should read as part of my fake book club? <sighs> I have a, a library of about 300 books that are across Audible um, these days. I'm trying to think if there's one um, that's driven me a lot lately. <sighs> The obvious one that helped me with soft skills and things was, um, yep, yeah, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But it's an oldie. It's probably on everyone's book list. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all right. That doesn't mean everyone's read it. Yeah. And the one, the first one I gave to my to my son when he started, um, he's a qualified planner, but he, he did mortgage broking 
when he was younger mm. to, to get to just have that authority more readily than, than full on financial advice. But it was the, the oldie bit of goodie how to win friends and influence people. Mm. Um, there's more modern versions of how to have conversation, but in any book by um, people around you know, how to build rapport, how to general rapport, not to do it to, to manipulate, but how to actually get better at, at dealing with people. Because when you, as we've talked about, when you get deep with people, and we talked about this last week, mm. people tell us things they don't tell anyone else. Mm. They tell us when they're about to have babies, when they're about to divorce. Mm. You know, we, we get to know first if we have a real relationship. Mm. And that real relationship only comes from listening and, and being trustworthy. Totally. And, you know, we were talking about the fact that I haven't had to have a really difficult conversation around someone telling me that they have become quite sick and I feel very grateful for that. But you're right, like we're – I have found out this uh, last week. Yeah, last week. Um, I'm the first to know of a new baby in the world. I'm the very first know. to know beyond their doctors. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing. Before they tell their parents sometimes. But no yeah. one else knows. I feel very um, – I feel very privileged. So – We are. Rob – you're amazing. You're so generous with your time. You are building things that we desperately need to incorporate to build long-standing client relationships. I want to say an enormous thank you for your time today. And I feel like this might not be the last conversation that we have. Pleasure. Happy to do a part two. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. 